Dr. Kevin Cavanaugh from HealthWatch USA and would like to today talk to you about immunosuppression and immune debt with SARS-CoV-2 and the surges that we're seeing with RSV infections. This talk is a summary of a paper which we have in submission and under consideration. And the co-authors of that paper are Dr. Lindsay Comier and Dr. Nellie Brusselaires. Now, as you all know, we have been experiencing surges in a number of infections. This includes flu, COVID-19, RSV, and recently you've been hearing about streptococcal infections and even septicemia. And these infections are filling our hospitals. And so it's something that's very concerning. It's not only occurring in our country, but in other countries. And a lot of people are trying to come up with, why is this occurring? Well, one of the initial proposals was by Robert Cohen back in August of 2021, and that's of immune debt. Dr. Cohen felt that because of a lack of stimulation of the immune system, because we weren't being exposed to antimicrobial agents, that we would see a rebound in infections once the pandemic concluded and NPIs or non-pharmaceutical interventions were lifted. And he coined immunity debt. And this was the first time that we can detect that this term was used. And if you think about it, it's not been really a factor with prior epidemics or pandemics. Southeast Asia commonly wears masks and has not had any significant difficulties with immune debt. We have had isolation, even lockdowns in regions with different pandemics and epidemics. And again, this hasn't been a factor. Students have had distant learning for various reasons, hasn't been a factor. And certainly you've had really decreased movements in population, sequestering and even isolation during periods of wartime and extreme civil strife. So this is something that's new, hasn't happened before in any great degree. And because of that, I think we need to be somewhat cautious about this concept of immune debt. Now, despite this, this concept was picked up by the CDC director, Rochelle Wolinsky, on November 1st, 2022. And during a meeting with the US Chamber of Commerce, she stated, what has happened in this current moment is we have several seasons where many people did not get exposed to the standard respiratory viruses. People were either undergoing mitigation strategies they were home, they were masked, they were not in school or daycare. All of that regular exposure that happens that boots immunity year after year did not happen. This was parroted on November 4th, 2022 in a CDC media telebriefing where it was said that we're seeing more RSV infections because in the last two years, We've not seen infections in children as we have previously. And so these children, if you will, need to become infected to move forward. Now, first of all, this statement may not have accurately depicted what the data was showing. At the time it was made on November 4th, we were definitely undergoing a surge of RSV infections and our hospitals were filling. November 5th is shown by the large red line in the graph, and this is of RSV cases. However, the previous year, as can be easily seen, had quite a few RSV cases. And probably if you look at the area under the curve up to November 5th, the cases were almost equal at that point. We had a very large surge the previous year. So the idea that we're seeing the surge because we didn't have infections last year, I don't think is supported by data. In addition, during that last year, 98% of the school districts were open and having in-person learning. Very few, 2%, were hybrid or remote learning. Now, granted, children were masking, but most of those masks were cloth masks which do not have the greatest efficacy with airborne pathogens. And I should note that one of the things I am really curious about is that 
some of the same groups of people that say we've got immune death and masking have ruined the immune system because people aren't exposed to pathogens are also saying masks don't work and don't do anything to prevent spread or disease. And really those two narratives, they are contradictory and conflicting. And so you really have to question sources coming from those sectors. Now, immune debt was also picked up by the lay press. The Daily Mail had an article recently about the United Kingdom having an inquiry regarding COVID-19. And one of the topics will be that children underwent lockdowns and what is the consequences of this? And this may have caused lifelong immunity problems. And so it is felt that social distancing, school closures, mask wearing meant that they were not exposed to common childhood illnesses. And this resulted in the children's immune systems not developing to fight infections. And one of the conclusions of the article was in fact, the immunity of the entire population has waned. This was taken a step further by a publication out of Australia that felt lockdown or lockdown debt, let's say, was causing problems with people's hearts, with elevation of cholesterol, blood sugar, and blood pressure, all of which were significantly higher, 33 to 47% during COVID-19. And they were blaming lockdowns for this because of increased stress, worrying, leading to overweight, less exercising, et cetera. However, association is not the same as causation. And so if you look at studies that have looked at these factors, it's not panning out. A recent study published in the Lancet, Diabetes and Endocrinology, looked at groups of people who had COVID-19 versus not having COVID-19. And they found that in a group of individuals that had SARS-CoV-2 infections, they had higher cholesterol, higher triglycerides, higher LDL cholesterol, and lower HDL cholesterol. Thus, there's not data to support this contention that lockdowns were affecting the heart to a greater degree than actually getting the infection. So what are some other explanations? Well, one is the explanation of immune theft. And this is a term that was coined by Dr. Ryan Gregory, who's an evolutionary biologist out of Ontario, Canada. And immune theft assumes that most of the individuals have had SARS-CoV-2 and that this has caused immunological dysfunction or hypofunction, making it more difficult for individuals to combat infections. Now, as of February, 2022, which was during one of our RSV surges, the United States CDC stated that 75% of the children were infected with SARS-CoV-2. And so this is really significant. Most of the children have been infected with SARS-CoV-2. And so that this now becomes a significant factor that we need to consider. Another good blog was published in Salon that looked at the concept of immune debt. And the idea here was the immune system works like a muscle and that it needs to be exercised or it becomes weak and your children or individuals will become susceptible to all sorts of different viruses and pathogens. And basically the conclusion of this op-ed was that, look, that's not how the immune system works. The immune system is more like a photo book where it gets exposures and it then has a memory of those viruses and bacteria. And that small amounts of lockdowns for a few weeks or a closures of a school where students are doing distant learning for six months or even 12 months of a year is unlikely to be producing the types of surges and in infections that we're seeing. Now, Germany's Minister of Health has stated that there are studies which are indicating that SARS-CoV-2 
can cause an incurable immunodeficiency. And that is very significant. He goes on to state that these studies have indicated that if someone has a severely aged immune system after two infections, it is advisable that they avoid further COVID infections. And so this is one of the first articulations of the problem of immune deficiency or immune dysfunction post SARS-CoV-2 infection. It's a recognition that it can exist and that this may be a significant problem. So let's look at other countries and see what their epidemiological data is. In Denmark, for example, they had a number of public health strategies which were implemented. And after they were lifted in 2021, 2022, there was a huge surge of RSV infections. However, the same thing then happened the following year, as you can see in the yellow curve. Although the curve isn't quite as high, it has a wider breadth. And certainly if these RSV infections were due to lack of exposure to RSV, you shouldn't have had the second surge. And here is RSV infection data from Sweden. Now, Sweden had very little public health interventions that were mandated. There was almost a total lack of public masking. Closures of kindergartens and primary schools did not occur, and the children were not wearing masks. Despite that, they had large surges of RSV infections in 2021 to 22 and in 2022 to 23. Now data from China is scant. It's very hard to come by. We were able to find one paper. This was a report from a hospital from Shanghai and they looked at RSV hospitalizations. Now China had very few COVID-19 infections. As you know, they would have one or two infections in a city and close down the entire community. And when Shanghai closed, it was for several months, it then reopened. And despite having a period of isolation, and this was very strict isolation in China and lockdowns, you did not see a surge in RSV infections. They just had a normal rate. Now they also didn't have any immune theft due to COVID-19 because the rates of COVID-19 infections at that time were very small. Now, there's also a number of clinical studies which are now beginning to be reported regarding this issue. The first by Wang, Davis, Berger, et al. And this was submitted to the MedRx IV preprint server. It's still in peer review. This study shows that children have been found to be almost twice as likely to develop an RSV infection if they had a prior documented SARS-CoV-2 infection. And what the study states is that among RSV infected children in 2022, 19.2% .2 had prior documented COVID-19 infections, significantly higher than the 9.7% among uninfected children, suggesting that prior COVID-19 could be a risk factor for RSV infections or that there are common risk factors for both viral infections. So again, this is highly suggested that RSV infections are caused by a prior documented COVID-19 infection. Another study published in the BMJ found that strep tonsillitis had occurred 34% more often in post-COVID-19 patients. And this is really significant. And this was a very large controlled data study that looked at 143,000 matched patients. And again, this is another added evidence that SARS-CoV-2 can be a risk factor for developing infections later on down the road. And so that is, I think, very significant. SARS-CoV-2 can cause associated infections at a later time. And this can occur well after the initial bout of SARS-CoV-2. Now, there's also laboratory evidence regarding immune dysfunction. And this is also, I think, very significant. 
Immune dysfunction post SARS-CoV-2 was first described by Anthony Leonardi in Frontiers of Immunology. He described aberrant T cell differentiation and lymphopenia in severe COVID-19 disease, and that SARS-CoV-2 is a lymphomanipulative pathogen and it distorts T cell function, numbers and deaths, and creates a dysfunctional immune response. Another study published in Nature Immunology found that long COVID-19 patients had immune dysfunction, which persisted for eight months. And that was the longest time period studied. And that this dysfunction was characterized as having highly activated innate immune cells and a lack of naive T and B cells. Now naive T and B cells are cells which haven't been exposed yet to a pathogen and they're able to react better to a pathogen producing an immunological response specific to that organism. In another study that was published in Signal Transduction and Targeted Therapy, the authors found that there was a direct infection of T cell population through an independent non-ACE2 receptor which caused pronounced cellular apthosis, that is programmed cellular death. They also identified SARS-CoV-2 RNA or antigens within the T cells. And so again, there may actually be a direct infection of SARS-CoV-2 with T cell populations. And that to me is a danger. Now, immune dysfunction is also seen in other viral illnesses, for example, in measles, there's a reduction in humoral immunity, which causes vulnerability to future infections. Influenza commonly causes lymphopenia, and this involves all types of subpopulations of the immune cells, but primarily a decrease in T cells. In addition, there are changes in the T cell and B cell populations. So this is not an uncommon concept that a viral illness can cause a dysfunction in the immune system, which compromises a person's ability to fight off infections in the future. So what does all this mean? Well, one of the implications is, is that COVID-19 can cause stealth disability and deaths, and that only counting severe pulmonary COVID-19 may result in a massive undercounting of deaths and disabilities, which are impacting our community. Now, for example, the state of Mississippi requires a positive test and administration of cortical steroids before a COVID-19 hospitalization is reported. However, this methodology is not going to capture a number of infections and in patients whose primary manifestations are embolic, cardiovascular, or other associated co-infections. And these sequelae may actually take place many months after the acute infection has resolved and the test has become negative. So that we have seen that COVID-19 laboratory tests may revert to negative, but patients are still at risk for delayed death. In an article published in Nature, they noticed at six months, there is almost a doubling of the total deaths from SARS-CoV-2. So an additional post-acute phase excess deaths of 8.39 per 1,000 patients is expected, and that is added to the deaths which occur during the acute phase of COVID-19. Now, in addition, this has implications that non-pharmaceutical interventions still need to be stressed and need to be followed by the public. This is especially important because there is evidence that reinfection further increases the risk of death, hospitalizations, and sequela in multiple organ systems from COVID-19. Now, the graph pictured in this slide is from an article published in Nature Medicine. And as you can see, as a person has zero, one, two, and three infections, the number of sequela and the severity of the sequela start to increase as the number of reinfections increase. And so that reinfections cause additive problems to patients and additive risks of long COVID. So it is important 
that we need to realize that attributing with little or no evidence that masking and lack of exposure is one of the primary drivers of surging infections feeds into the narrative of anti-public health conspiracy theorists and discourages critical interventions needed to mitigate these sequelae. I think as individuals and as professionals, we need to do everything we can to encourage vaccinations, the continued use of masking. If you are in a crowded indoor setting or in an indoor setting with very poor ventilation, and we need to encourage people to follow public health advice. In the United States, we are still having approximately 450 deaths per day, far too many to be tolerated. And with the disability of long COVID mounting, we need to do something to quell spread. And we also need to give time for our pharmaceutical industry and our medical industry to come up with better strategies, better medications in order to combat this illness. So at this time, I will stop my presentation and open the floor for questions.